Hello again. <laughs> the Honorable David A. Clark Jr., former sheriff of Milwaukee County, has enjoyed a long and illustrious career in law enforcement that spans nearly four decades. His public service began in 1978 at the Milwaukee Police Department, where he served 24 distinguished years and was promoted numerous times, including being chosen as the commander of the department's first district and commanding officer of MPD's Intelligence Division, which produced and shared intelligence for dignitary protection in conjunction with the Secret Service, the Department of State, and other federal agencies. In 2002, he was appointed at Milwaukee County Sheriff's by Republican Governor Scott McCollum. And in November of that year, he was elected for his first four-year term, earning 64% of the vote. Sheriff Clark was re-elected four times, and his victory margin rose to 79% when he was last re-elected in 2014. Earlier this year, he released his best-selling book, Cop Under Fire, which chronicles his childhood and the challenges he and countless other officers face in law enforcement today. Throughout his law enforcement career, Clark also received numerous awards, including the Charlton Heston Courage Under Fire Award, and the, American, excuse me, the Americanism Award for the Milwaukee County War Memorial Veterans. In addition to his dedication and focus as the sheriff of a large metropolitan county like the Milwaukee, Clark developed a passion for political commentary, becoming known as the People's Sheriff because he could explain complicated national controversies in a way that everyday people could understand. He was the keynote speaker at countless events across the U.S meeting with business persons, police officers, sheriffs, and their deputies, as well as community leaders and ordinary Americans who appreciated his no-nonsense way of promoting conservative values. It wasn't long before he realized that he had a gift for relating to people and that he truly enjoys mobilizing Americans to become more politically active and civically engaged. Please join me in welcoming Sheriff Clark. Thank you, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to go through a couple of house rules first before I speak. I have some prepared remarks and then I have some extemporaneous remarks that I want to share with you as well. It's, it's an extreme honor, it really is, to be here today to have been asked to come and, and, and speak to all of you. Uh, I'll probably say this one or two times during this presentation. This is not about me. This is not about me. This is about the movement. This is about the movement to save this republic from the grips being placed on it by the left, this socialist movement, this movement to destroy our republic as we know it, the freedoms, the liberties that we enjoy. And it is a fight for the soul of this country. And you notice I said a fight for the soul of this country. And what I like to tell people as well is if you're going to join me, and that's your decision, you got to be a fighter. You have to be a fighter. You have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and engage because this is going to be a contact sport. This is not going to be resolved using some of the methods in the past in our society, a decent society, where we debate and discuss and we try to win arguments through debate and discussion, the left doesn't want to talk about it. The left has made it very clear, as you know, by the control of the language, the language police. And the reason they want to do that is because if you control the language, you control the narrative. And their narrative is a pack of lies. It's deceitful. And it's meant to fool, fool people, to hoodwink them into thinking that this isn't a great country and that we should change this form of government, which we should. So that's why I say this is a fight. But I want to also say, let not your hearts be troubled, as is written in the Bible, John 14, verse 1. And I also like to 
recite this one as well when I speak. It's Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Now we're going through a period of great change in this country, but this isn't the first time this country has been at this particular point. If you go back to the American Revolution, period of great change, it was a fight. People had to literally risk their lives to form this new great nation. They weren't going to be able to convince King George that we wanted our own freedom and way of life. He wasn't hearing it. So they had to go to war. Also, if you think about it, the Civil War was a period of great change in this country as we struggled with this ugly institution of slavery and how to abolish it and get rid of it and give freedom and liberty to all people. Again, it wasn't going to be done in the halls of Congress through debate and discussion that was tried and failed. We had to go to war. It was a literal fight. We've gone through two world wars for much of the same reason. This country has gone through a Great Depression, another defining period of time. When things looked bleak, things looked dark. We didn't know if this country was going to survive economically, the Great Depression. We've gone through the turbulent 60s, another period of great change in this country, the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam. The country seemed to be coming apart at the seams. We've been through 9-11, another period of great change in this country as we grappled with this, this concept of radical Islamic terrorism. We've been through a lot, but you know what? This country has survived those great defining moments. It's, it has survived those periods of time because this is a resilient country and we will survive this. But we'll only survive if we win. The only way we're going to win is if you all decide you want to join me and others in this fight to save this republic. I cannot do it by myself. As a matter of fact, I'm taking on a new role now. I retired recently after f nearly four decades in law enforcement. Let me give you a, a, a brief tour of how I got here today, and I don't mean the fight from Milwaukee. Several years ago, two things were going on. One was the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, followed by the riots in Baltimore, Maryland, over this perceived police use of force, which was a facade. How many of you in here have ever read Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals? Okay, a few hands. For those of you who haven't get it, it's a small, it's a quick read. You should be able to read the thing in, in a day if you just sit down for a couple of hours. It is their primer. It's their playbook. If you want to know how to counter the left, their playbook is right there, and they're following it to a T. Barack Obama was a disciple of Saul Alinsky. And so if you want to know what they do, why they do it, and how they do it, read that book, because when you come up with counter strategies and when you come up with counter narratives, you're going to be able to do it because their playbook is right there. So we have this, this attack on police. Why did we have this attack on police? We had this attack on police because the police officer, the American police officer, is on the front lines of defending the rule of law. In order for the anarchists to win, they know they must destroy this concept of the rule of law. We, not so much anymore, me, I retired. The American police officer defends the rule of law. They're on the front lines. And they know that if we weaken the police, and if we destroy their will to enforce the rule of law, they're halfway to victory. Chaos, that's what they're trying to promote. That's what they're trying to create, chaos within this orderly society. Because once chaos begins, they can be more successful. And there's nobody to push back. 
So I identified this thing for what it was back in 2014. And I said so publicly on national cable television. I said, this movement, this started out as hands up, don't shoot. It was hands up, don't shoot long before it was Black Lives Matter. And when that lie was discovered, they had to quickly go back into hiding. And if you go back to the 60s, always visit your history, folks. Your history will give you a clue about, because the stuff is cyclical. And if you go back to the 60s, the same anarchist movement, it was the same movement, different people, to destroy the rule of law and the Constitution and our republic. One of the mistakes they knew they made in the 60s was that their movement was too white. And it didn't capture the emotion of America like the civil rights movement did. So what they've done is they've infiltrated this Antifa movement. It's the Occupy Wall Street people. It's the same people. Now they're masked. And now they've infiltrated what maybe started out as a legitimate issue, police use of force. We can have those discussions. We derive our authority, we the police, from the will of the people. Right, you get to tell us how you want to be policed to an extent. But you do that through legislators, you do that through the legislative bodies, things like that. So they infiltrated that group to put a mask on. It was the Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was never about black life. Because if black lives truly mattered to these folks, they would be protesting every week in front of every abortion clinic in America. <laughs> because if you think about it, if you think about planned Call them planned genocide. That's what it was. Their founder. <laughs> Their founder, Margaret Sanger, a eugenist, advocated for the extermination of the black race from the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, she referred to black people as human weeds that needed to be exterminated. That's Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood aborts more black babies than any other race in America. So I ask, where's Black Lives Matter? I thought Black Lives Matter. In one year in New York recently, I think it's 2012, but don't hold me to the year, more black babies were aborted than born. Think about that, in New York City. One of the other things I said, if Black Lives Mattered, this movement would be protesting in every urban center in America where we see on a daily basis young black men killing other young black men. And so I ask, where's Black Lives Matter? I thought Black Life Mattered. Black life doesn't matter to this movement. That is a mask. It is a mask which captures the emotion of people who maybe aren't as versed in some of these issues. They don't ask for the data, they don't ask for the research, but they hear these things and they, they, all of a sudden the emotional part gets to them and they, they start to feel sorry and have empathy. This isn't about the police use of force. It's not about black life, it's about destroying this republic, weakening that institution, that being police organizations that defend the rule of law. So I said in 2014, this is a political construct. This has nothing to do with black life or the police use of force. It had everything to do with energizing the black vote for the 2016 election. That's what that was about.
and I identified it early on. Of course, I was told I was crazy. Well, look where we are today. So I sat up there and watched as this profession that I've been a part of for a very long time came under attack. Are we perfect? <laughs> Not by any stretch of the imagination. Are police agencies perfect? Not even close. But we are the best our communities have to offer. And without the police in your local community, it would denigrate, denigrate into chaos and collapse. Who but the police is out there? Who but police officers? Because I have said this as well. You want to know who truly believes that black life matters? It's the American police officer, mainly white, who go into these urban ghettos, risk their lives to preserve peace and to save other black people. So something else went on. Before I get into that, you know, I saw this profession under attack, and nobody was defending it. When I say nobody, I'm talking about within my ranks. I was a law enforcement executive, right? I'm the sheriff, top law enforcement officer in my county. And I'm watching this, these attacks, these smears that had no foundation. They weren't backed by any empirical research. There was no data to support it that black that, that, that law enforcement officers use force as, at an inordinate rate against young black males. I'm telling you today, the data doesn't exist because it's not true. As a matter of fact, the data and the research show the opposite. So it's a lie. So I renamed Black Lives Matter Black Lies Matter because it was premised on a lie about the police use of force. And I stood up there and watched, and like I said, I send men and women out in the harm's way every day. I don't know if they're coming back at the end of the day. The least I can do is demonstrate to them that since I'm sending them out in the harm's way, that I'll have their back if something goes horribly wrong through no fault of theirs. Somebody's got to fight for them. And no executive would do it. And I finally got tired of it. And I had some platforms available to me through television. And I stood up on behalf of the American police officer. And I made it clear, I said, I don't speak for every police officer in the United States of America, but I will speak for this profession because I've been a part of it and it's been good to me. So I went out to defend the profession and in defending the profession, I was defending the American police officer, but I could not believe as I stood there and watched these smears and these lies against your community's finest, no chief or sheriff would stand up and say, hold on a second, what are you talking about? Show me the data, show me the evidence to support your claims, and I'll take a look at it. Because that's what I did. I said, I'll take a look at it. If there's a problem, I said, I want to know about it. I'm an elected official. I work on behalf of the people. I'll take a look. You know what? They couldn't show me because it doesn't exist. And I knew that when I said that. I said, they won't be able to show me anything. So that kind of elevated my profile. I didn't choose that. I think the moment chose me. And in those moments like that, and you'll, if you haven't come across them already today, many of you probably have, sometimes moments reach out and they grab you. And the question is, do you have the will to lead? Do you have the will to get up there and put yourself? Because when I did that, I put a big target on my back. And the left has been coming at me with the ferociousness of a junkyard dog ever since. But I don't care. I don't have that fear. I get death threats. I get smears. I get called ugly names. What did I start out by saying? It's not about me. And I have to remind myself of that from time to time. I look in the mirror, I say, Dave, when I get one of those ugly letters, someone sent me one recently, an email to the people sheriff. It said, congratulations on being named Donald Trump's house nigger. You think that stuff doesn't hurt? Sure it does. 
But it's at times like that I go to the mirror, I look in the mirror and I go, David, this is not about you. This is about this movement. And this email here is designed to dispirit you. To make you take a step back and maybe walk away from the fight. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not going to happen. Something else happened not too long after that, and it was the 2016 presidential election. And you know, there was a lot of phrases and words being thrown around about uh, the, the most important election of our lifetime. I never say that. You know why? Because every election is the most important election of our lifetime, which is why people need to vote in every election every election that they can. Not everybody does, but again, it's the right we have in America. You don't have to vote. But I felt with what this country was going through at that period of time, the race war spurned on by former President Barack Obama, who capitalized and gained politically off that style of divide and conquer, get people pitted against each other, angry with each other, And I felt that this country needed a different type of leader. We've tried the old way. The person who's come up through the political ranks. And here's the problem with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Someone that chooses a political career. But if you spend 20, 30, 40 years in that environment, you become a product of it. You become a product of K Street, money, influence peddling, status quo, protect the status quo, keep things the way they are, keep promising people and not delivering. And I just thought we couldn't afford that. We needed a different type of leader. I had been approached in the primary, the Republican primary, by no less than four of the candidates who wanted my support. And, you know, I don't think I'm that big a deal. I really don't. And I said that to them. I said, yeah, I just don't think I'm that big a deal. I don't know what I can do for you. But I decided to stay out of the primary. I wanted the voters within the GOP, the Republican Party, to pick the person that they wanted to be in the general election. And I don't belong to the party. Okay, some of you may know I run as a area. I'm more an old school type Democrat like my mom and dad. My mom and dad were Truman Democrats, JFK Democrats, Bobby Kennedy Democrats, Scoop Jackson Democrats. Those four that I just mentioned wouldn't be allowed in the Democrat Party today. So I kind of grew up in that mold. My family was not real political, but I'm old school. So I wanted the voters the members and whoever wanted to within the GOP to pick. And I told them that. I said, whoever survives this primary comes out of it. I said, I will get behind that person and I will fight like hell to help them become the next president of the United States. And one of those four was Donald Trump. And I told him exactly that. And they all understood. None of them were bent out of shape or hurt. I, I just said, let the people <laughs> decide in the primary. That's what primaries are for. So I watched, and I watched these individuals closely, got to know some of them a little more intimately than others, and I listened. You know what I was hearing from many of them? The same hot air we hear every election cycle, except for one person, and that was Donald Trump. Now, I don't care what you think of Donald Trump as a person. For that matter, I don't much care what you think of me. But I saw a leader. I saw a new way of doing things. 
Did I see perfection? I wasn't looking for perfection. I was looking for leadership, ladies and gentlemen. Some of what leadership is, is to say things that need to be said in spite of the criticism. Because one of the aspects of leadership that I think is the most important is courage. Have the courage of your convictions. Articulate it, regardless of the blowback you're going to get. I want to know where you stand. Put the talking points away. Put the canned stump speeches away. That stuff's all rehearsed. It's all focus groups, uh, focus grouped, right? Here's what the people want to hear. I don't care what the people want to hear. I want to know what you believe in. And so when Donald Trump, and I predicted, for what it's worth, in the, during the primary, I predicted Donald Trump would be the next president of the United States. It's on record. Go check my podcast. I did a weekly podcast for The Blaze. It's there. Anything I say, I can verify. And I said he was going to be the next president of the United States. I'll tell you why, why I thought that. Because I felt like many of you in this country, we need a different way. We need a different way of thinking. We need a different type of behavior from our elected officials. So they kept counting him out, right? He'd lose a state here or there, and they'd count him out. Oh, is this the downfall? Is this it for Donald Trump? Donald Trump went out and said some things that I might not have said, but he said it. And one of the things I say to this day when people come to me about something Donald, President Donald Trump, pardon me, but I got to know him during the primary, and so it was always Mr. Trump and Donald. So if I leave out the president, it's no slight to him. I think you know that. But, like I said, what was important to me was that we know where the person stands. So Donald Trump got the nomination, and he came back around to me. He circled back around to me. I met Donald Trump two years before that in Nashville, Tennessee, at an NRA convention we were both speaking at. And I had just gotten off the stage at that convention. And I was leaving, I was being escorted back to my hotel room, and then Donald Trump and his entourage were pulling up to the speaker's area where they come in in the back. And I looked up and I see Mr. Trump get out and his entourage, and I tell my escorts, I said, hold on a second, I want to go over and say hi to Mr. Trump. I don't watch The Apprentice, I don't watch much TV, you know, but I, every, people know who Donald Trump is. I knew who Donald Trump was, I just wanted to say hi. So I waited my turn as, you know, this big group surrounds him and he's talking and I waited my turn and he's heading in toward the door and so I walked over in his direction and I said, Mr. Trump, and before I could get another word out, he said, David, he calls me David to this day, he didn't call me Sheriff, and he calls me David, he said, I've been watching you on TV, you are doing an outstanding job, keep it up. I was blown away by that. I was literally blown away by it, that he knew who I was. Like I said, I'm not that big a deal, but he knew my first name. Most people know me as Sheriff Clark. They probably couldn't even tell you my first name. And that was before he announced he was running for president. So let me fast forward back now, uh, or up to um, where I was. He circled back around. We were in, I believe, Louisville, Kentucky. Another NRA convention. Yeah, I'm an NRA member. And he's, he's coming off the stage. I hadn't spoke yet. And I'm in the green room, this room where they put the speakers in. And I asked somebody in the hallway, I said, hey, when Mr. Trump gets off the stage, does he come up this way? And there's this big ramp. And he said, yeah, he'd be coming up that way. So I went to position myself. And all of a sudden, this big entourage, because anywhere Donald Trump is, there's an entourage, right? It's a big deal. A lot of commotion. And so I hear this noise coming up, and I look down. Over, I'm, on, I'm on this ramp, like I'm looking down there. And I, I yell out, Mr. Trump. And once again, he asked for my support. He said, you know, I need your support. Now he's got the nomination. I said, I'm a man of my word. I said to you, I'll let the voters decide. And whoever won this nomination, I won. He looks up, 
And he says, I gotta go hi say hi to my favorite sheriff. He was supposed to be going out another way. He detoured, came up and he talked to me. And once again, he asked for my support. He said, you know, I need your support. Now he's got the nomination. I said, I'm a man of my word. I said to you, I'll let the voters decide and whoever won this nomination, I was going to get behind them and fight for them to become the next president. So I said, I'm in. I said, I don't know what I can do for you. Well, my advice is to put me in the trenches because I'm a fighter. I want to be in the trenches. I don't need the glare of the lights. I don't need the TV cameras. I don't need the microphone. I said, I just want to fight. Tell me where you need me to fight. And he thanked me and we went our separate ways and then later his people from the campaign got a hold of me and uh, put me in a kind of a lead role. And I did two tours, the Great America PAC tours. We did eight different, eight different cities, five different states in a week, twice this past summer, a year ago now touring the country, attending the rallies, getting the crowd stoked up for the president. And then Donald Trump uh, took the stage. He didn't appear at all of them, but our, our job was to rally the base. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where I got that feeling he was gonna be the next president of the United States. I felt this undercurrent out there that the polls were not capturing, the polls did not care about, the media did not care about, you know, flyover country in between New York and Los Angeles. There was a groundswell of people who have had it with what's been going on in this country, with a number of things. The destruction of our Constitution, the attacks on our Constitution, the marginalization of God in our culture and in our society. We've become an administrative state, no longer guided by the Constitution. And they saw what I saw in Donald Trump, a chance to do it a different way. And I sensed that, and that's when I started predicting he's going to be the next president of the United States. So we had the campaign, and you all know what happened there. Uh, God was looking down on us. He was. It's the way I feel. God will not allow us to destroy this republic. I mentioned those periods of great change in this country it could have. Had Great Britain run, won the revolution, we wouldn't be a republic today. Had the South won a civil war, I'm not gonna say that 150 years later, slavery would still be an institution, but it would have gone on for another half century. That's what I mean when I say God's not going to allow this republic to destroy itself. As long as we pray, right? We ask him for his guidance and his blessings. He'll answer those prayers. And that's what I felt he did in November of 2016. He answered our prayers. So we get to the last night of the second tour and we're in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, the map that I saw him morning through didn't happen. Okay, I didn't predict everything precisely. I thought he would win Florida, Ohio. I thought he'd win Virginia, which he didn't. And then of course he had to, you know, maybe eke out one in Maine, and there's some other state in New Hampshire in the Northeast where he had a slight chance. He had to pick that up. And of course he had to win Iowa, but there was the map that looked more probable for him to do this, it didn't happen. He wins Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Nobody saw that coming. I never saw it coming. But one of the other things that I said and why I thought Donald Trump was going to win the election numbers wise and through the electoral map was I said, I call her Mrs. Bill Clinton. 
call her that for a reason. That's who she is. See, she uses Bill when it's expedient for her, right? <laughs> she needed his juice to help win this election. But then all of a sudden, she wants to be known as Hillary. Well, I go, no, no. This is Bill Clinton. Because you're right. I, I'm, my mom's old. My, I'm a junior. My dad's David Clark. She signs things, Miss and Mrs. David Clark. That's old school. But, but anyway, I said again, and I kept repeating it, Mrs. Bill Clinton has a black vote deficiency dilemma. Black voters will not come out for her like they did for Barack Obama and like they did for her husband. I knew it. You know why? She's Black people are smarter than that. More obvious reasons. Black people aren't stupid. She never visited Wisconsin. She lost Wisconsin by 22,000 votes. She could have won that in Milwaukee County alone. Blacks didn't turn out for her. And in all these other areas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, they didn't turn out in the record numbers that they did for Barack Obama. And I knew. They weren't going to because she's not emotionally connected. She needed the black vote. And that was part of that Black Lives Matter was a political construct to try to energize the black vote to turn out for Democrats and mainly for her in the 2016 election. So Raleigh, North Carolina, the night before the election, and uh, then Donald Trump shows up at that event. We're less than 24 hours away from the polls being open. And the president comes in and speaks at the rally. We all spoke. He gets off the stage. He comes to the back of the stage. And, and I just yelled out. I don't know why I did this. But I yelled out to the people in the back. I said, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night, this will be the president-elect of the United States. And it happened. So that night, in Raleigh, the campaign asked if I would come back to New York. They had their victory rally or, or poll, whatever they call election watch at uh, this hotel in New York City. And they asked if I would come and be a part of it. And I said, nope, my work is done. I did what you guys asked me to do. I fought as hard as I could. I paid politically for getting behind him. But I felt my work was done. And I said, I just want to go home. So they tried to arm twist, and, and I just, I'm, I'm done. Time to go home. So I went home. And I thought to myself on the flight home, I still felt he was going to win, but you know, there's no guarantees. But I thought my job was over. I said, I'm done, right? I, I, I fought, did what you asked me to do. So he gets elected president of the United States. Of course, I was head over heels over that. And then I attended the inauguration, get invited to all that stuff. And you know, well, I mean, that kind of goes along with it. I wanted to experience an inauguration in Washington, D.C., first time in my life. So I went to that. And the day following his inauguration, actually it was that night, Antifa shows up. Produces Antifa. Writing in Washington, D.C. And the next day is this big women's whatever in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to see some of that. So I'm walking around Washington, D.C. I remember I was on 14 and F Street. People attend. The thing was infiltrated too by some driving down.
Tina and a big float on a trailer, Statue of Liberty and Trump, you know. And, it, and he's driving through there, and all of a sudden, off to the right, where the street was cordoned off for the marchers. So you gotta stay in your boundaries, you know? That's what the rules are. Well, we're gonna block the streets for your rally, but you gotta stay over here. They started peeling off, and they came and surrounded this float. And of course, they were jeering it, and they surrounded it so it couldn't move. And I'm wondering where the heck the police were. Because I didn't see a lot of police presence, but that's no knock on them. They only have so many police. A million people down, they just don't have enough police. And so I stood, I took up a position with my back, because I'm a cop, I think, <laughs> safety first, to a building, attack from behind, or people knew who I was, right? I mean, it, they knew it was Sheriff Clark, and I could get some real ugly stares. This stuff doesn't bother me, but I didn't want anybody throwing something at me from behind, so I put my back up, because I was the one to watch this float, and I just said to myself, if they start to attack this float, you know, try to tip it over, whatever, all bets were off, I was gonna jump in. Okay, so then finally six police officers show up on motorcycles and they kind of moved the crowd back and this float was able to back up and they got them on it, but that was an open street to traffic. But traffic wasn't allowed to go down it because these people decided they were gonna shut this street down. See, that's chaos. So I watch that, and I go home, and this resistance movement starts. And this thing is real. And at first, you know, you look and you say, well, it's just people who haven't gotten over the election, haven't, haven't um, resigned themselves to the fact that Donald Trump is now the 45th president of the United States. And I thought, they'll get over it. Residual anger, emotion, happens after elections, happens after sporting events, right? When your team loses, we all know, and you process it out, and by midweek, you're done, you're on to the next week. They play so-and-so next week, and you get keyed up, and you, you start over again. But this didn't stop, and it got worse. And there came a point in time where I said to myself, gosh darn it. I thought my job was done. I'm going to have to suit up and get back in the fight. Because I had to. Because I said to myself, David, you helped Donald Trump become the 45th president of the United States. Now you got to fight for him, for his agenda, his vision, his policies, and his direction for America. Because I knew this wasn't going to happen without a struggle, but I didn't think we'd see it like it was. I'll, I'll admit, I was a little naive in that. But I thought, we, he's a man alone. The entire belt weighs against him, both parties, by the way. They don't want Donald Trump, he's an outsider. He's messing up the party. Not the party and political party, their, their party. Because life is good for people in Washington, D.C. The lobbyists, the lawyers, the Apollo, life is good. But it's not so good back home. It's not so good at ground level. It's not so good in the American ghetto. It's not so good if you can't find a job. It's not so good if you don't have a safe neighborhood. It's not so good if you are a small business person and you're barely able to make ends meet. Life isn't so good like it is in Washington, D.C. Those people are totally disconnected from reality, from what's happening at ground level. They really are. And some of those people are my friends. Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan represents, we share voters in Milwaukee County. He's got a little corner of Milwaukee County, and Paul and I talk all the time, but I don't care. I, I don't let friendship get in the way of that. I've always committed myself to you, the people. And they weren't hearing you in Washington, D.C. And they weren't going to stand for Donald Trump to come in here and, and upset the, 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 the apple cart to the good thing that they have going on inside the Beltway. 
So I felt a duty and obligation to get back out there and start fighting and start rallying the people and rallying the troops, energizing the troops. Because this is a fight. And like I said, the, the, the traditional means of doing this, Congress debating, you know, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. Illegal immigration is killing this country. If you're going to be a sovereign nation, and the United States is a sovereign nation, you have to have borders. Those borders have to be defined, and you have to protect and defend those borders. The left wants borderless society. We're a republic. We're not that. There's a number of reasons why we need effective immigration law. One is we have domestic and foreign security issues. Illegal drugs and guns coming across the border, gangs, MS-13, coming across the border in the United States wreaking havoc in neighborhoods, selling poison to your kids, your friends, a form of drugs, the violence associated with it. Then, of course, you have national security issues, 9-11. guys were coming back and forth across the border, flying into the country at will. In defiance of the State Department, some of these people were on no-fly lists and it was, wasn't being enforced. So all the American people really are asking is, okay, Congress, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says the Congress shall create laws on immigration. Naturalization, it says, but immigration. The Congress. The Congress. Not the states. Not the courts. Not the president. Like Obama did with DACA. It says the Congress. Now, the Congress didn't want it. It's too tough an issue, right? You're worried about getting reelected. This isn't about their reelection. Why do we have to remind them of this? This is not about their reelection. It's about fulfilling your oath. You said I'll support and defend the Constitution, force the law. It's like the president does the same thing. And I said, well, just do it. You took it all. Those are words on paper. Do it. I know it's hard. If it's too hard, you know what? Quit. Just quit. Let somebody else do it. Second reason why it's important to defend your borders, they're public health issues. Remember the Zika virus? Zika virus? Didn't start here in the United States. It was brought over here from people traveling back and forth across our borders. And if you remember, during that scare, Zika virus, we started setting up checkpoints in certain countries where this was known to be a problem. And they were testing people, taking their temperature before they get on a plane. That's why you have to have effective immigration. Public health issues. H1N1 did not start in the United States. So you want to prevent the spread of communicable diseases from some of these countries well, they're more prone to this for whatever reason, right? I mean, nobody created the mosquitoes, but some of the, the, um, the hygiene issues and whatnot. And so you have to, for public health, you have to have effective immigration. The third reason you have to have effective immigration, people don't like this. They cringe when I say it. I don't care. It's true. You want to prevent the influx of a lot of another country's ne'er-do-wells. People are just going to come over here, they have nothing to add to our American society. They come over there and they just jump on the public assistance role. It's a stress on our public health system. It's a strain on our school systems. 
I don't mind educating their kids, but this stuff costs money. And so you have to just control the flow. We're not saying no new immigrants. You have to control it. You know what every other country does? We have the most lax immigration laws in the world. So other countries do it, oh, no one, the left doesn't say anything. We do it, oh, you're xenophobic. Oh, no, not really. All right, the green cards, right, when they expire, you gotta go home. We weren't enforcing that. So now we're sitting here with this huge problem because of neglect. So Donald Trump comes in and says, we're gonna straighten out this immigration system. He throws it back to Congress with the DACA, where he undid Obama's imperial uh, decision to uh, do what the Constitution says is Congress's role, right? And remember what he said? Former President Barack Obama, he said, if they don't act, I will. That's not what this document allows. It has, under Article II, the executive branch, and it says what the executive can and can't do. And it doesn't say you can bypass Congress if they won't do their job. It doesn't say that in here. So he did that outside the Constitution. So Donald Trump comes in, and he voids that order and throws it back into Congress where it is supposed to be, and he's the xenophobe. No, he's fulfilling his oath. That's all he's doing. So now, here I am, back in the fight and in a new role. Like I said, when this thing first started, I just wanted to be a foot soldier. Well, now I'm asked to be a general, a leader of the movement. And again, remember when I said there are moments in time in your life, and you're going to see them if you haven't already. They're going to be screaming out for you. You can tune it out if you want. But it's going to be a moment asking for leadership, calling on you. The question is, will you have the will to answer that call? Because it's, it's painful. It hurts. It's time consuming away from home a lot. But again, go back to what I said, it isn't about me and my hardships and my life's been good to me. Now it's my job to come out and encourage you to get involved, to stay involved. Because I'm near the end. It's going to be your turn. And when I think you're ready for it, I'm going to get out of the way, unlike some of these people on Capitol Hill who are there for 30, 40, 50 years. I tell them, well, just get off the stage, man. Let somebody else. Give somebody else a shot. But I just want to make sure that you're ready. You don't have to do it like I do it. You don't have to do what I do. But you got to be ready for this moment when you're there, because it could be tough, it's going to be hard. You're going to want to quit at times, but you can't. Founding Fathers didn't quit. Abraham Lincoln didn't quit. He paid for it with his life. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't quit because the civil rights movement got too hard. And they're getting water cannons and fire hoses and dogs sick down. They didn't quit. And he paid for it with his life. John Kennedy didn't quit. And so I look and I say, if they can do it in a small way, because I'm not on that plane of those greats, but I look and I say, if they can do it, hell, I can do it too. And that's my challenge to you folks. Okay, believe in something. Know what you stand for. Know why. Not because it's, it seems like a cool thing to do. Because human beings are, we're kind of pack animals. Group dynamic is very strong with human beings. We like associating in groups. But I know what I stand for. When I say I'm a conservative and I am, 
I can articulate what that means. I believe in the rule of law. I believe that the Constitution protects individuals, not groups. These are individual rights. You don't derive your rights out of here by membership in a group. These are individual rights. So I hear things about the Second Amendment, and these are individual rights. Don't, in a group fashion, take these things away from people. Take them away from individuals. I believe in military superiority and safe streets here at home. And I believe that, I believe in more rights for the states. It's kind of the four or five things it means to me. It doesn't have to mean the same to you. But be able to articulate it. If someone says, well, you, you call yourself a conservative, and I'll do that when people come up. Yeah, I'm a conservative. I go, what does it mean to you? And you watch people start to stutter and stammer. and They, they haven't thought about it. I said, what do you stand for? You gotta stand for something that you can articulate and that you're willing to fight for. How many of you in here have a constitution with you? Not too many. There's another challenge. These come in pocket sizes. They literally fit in a pocket, okay? Literally. Breast pocket, purse. Get one of these and just keep it with you. If you believe in this thing, carry it around with you. Refer to it. I'm not a constitutional expert. I don't need to be. These, the people who put this document together, this in the Declaration of Independence, this one has the Declaration of Independence in it too. I read that once a year. It's eerie how similar some of the things they were going through under King George back in the 1700s hundreds, is going on today in the United States of America. How did we get back to that? The abuses of a tyrannical government, the taking away from free, of freedoms and liberty, how did we get back to that 240, 50 years later? We lost our way. If the Founding Fathers came back to this moment in time, they would look and they would say, how did you guys screw this up? We handed off something that was pretty good to you, and you screwed it up. You're back, you're an administrative state, you're not a republic. People sidestep this, including the courts, by the way, like it's nobody's business. And you have to ask, we died for this? So you guys could return to life under King George, but now you're doing it to yourselves? It's not a foreign nation doing it? So I carry one of these, and I have a bunch of them, so I can just, I don't have to worry about forgetting this one. I got one in my vehicle. I got one and several in my home. I got, I used to keep several of these at work, and I always just had it. I love when people say, I know my rights. I go, oh yeah? Tell me about them. They said, naming rights that are not enumerated in here. I go, where'd you get that right from? At least I can look it up. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I'm going to. Young lady, what amendment gave women the right to vote? And I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to, put, I am putting you in the spot, but I'm not trying to embarrass you. Well, that's why I, if someone were to ask, I don't have this memorized. Pardon me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No. It's actually, yeah, someone said it. It's the, uh, the 19th. Yeah, it's uh, the 19th. Sir, one amendment freed the slaves. Okay, 
someone yelled out, but I was, that's fine. Yeah, 13th, 14th. Um, you, you gotta know this stuff. People died to free the slaves, my ancestors. If you go back far enough, they never saw freedom. And I couldn't, can't even tell people what amendment to this document, that's the brilliance of this document. Funny fathers, because even for all its flaws, this is still the greatest country in the world. Why? Because we have this. Keeps government in check, supposed to, not so much today. But it tells government not what they can do, what they can't do. They can't deny these things without due process. So even though when this country started, slavery was an institution, the courts did not free the slaves. The Supreme Court did not free the slaves. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court several times upheld the institution of slavery. Plessy versus Ferguson, the Dred Scott decision, upheld the institution. So, so I don't worry about the courts and how wonderful and all of this that they are. It's, it's, this freed the slaves. We amended the Constitution, and the same with women's right to vote. The courts did not give women the right to vote. So whenever I hear the courts today giving rights to people, I go, you cannot do that. You gotta go through this process, and it outlines what the process is. It says, here's what you gotta do. You gotta get two-thirds of the states, the convention, and, and change it. We've amended this 27 times. We can amend it at 28. If we want to give new rights to people, we can do that, but it's through this. It's not through the courts, and it's not through some law passed by Congress. If we're going to give you new rights, it's got to be done this way. Because when we get away from this, then someone else can come along after that and do what they want, and it's going to be a mess. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America.